Five, four, three, two, one. He has displayed great skills and great courage out there, remember, handling the pressure of leading the Open for 36 holes or fending off some of the world's best players. And with a score of 271, the winner of the gold medal and the champion golfer of the year is Brian Harmon. And Alonso drills one back toward the left field wall and it's out of here! Pete Alonso with a line drive three-run homer. He hit this one deep to center. Back goes Bader on the warning track at the wall. Strikes again. Alvarez chops it to third. Nice hop for LeMayu across the diamond. And the Yankees win three to one. A nice clean affair. You're listening to another edition of Sports Today with Peter J. Here's your host, Peter J. Mulroy. Yeah, you could feel it coming with the Mets, right? As, as nice as that moment was in the first of two, <clears throat> excuse me, against the Yankees in the Subway Series earlier in the week, getting the victory. Two dingers from Pete Alonso, who from a batting average perspective this season has really struggled. You could sense that changes were coming. So they split with the Yankees during the week in the Bronx. And this team is now, as we're starting to see, and we're going to get into it throughout the show in a few minutes, massive changes coming in Queens. Welcome to the latest edition, Sports Today with Peter J. A touch after 7 o'clock p.m. on the East Coast, Friday, July 28th. Big show today. Tons going on in Major League Baseball with the trade deadline looming. 6 p.m. August 1st, that's when it stops. That's when it comes to a halt. So there's a lot of teams in the league, including the Yankees and specifically the Mets, who will look very different than they do right now on July 28th. Could be good, could be bad. Some teams are going to be buyers. Obviously, there will be sellers. And the market will continue to dictate, as will team records, as we head into the beginning of August, which becomes that backstretch of the MLB season, right? With so much on the line for all of these teams that are those fringe teams. So we've got all of that to run through. Tons going on in the NFL with the preseason approaching. Jets will play next week in the Hall of Fame game in Canton, Ohio as they get uh, Klecko and Revis enshrined into Canton. So we'll talk about everything that's gone on there. Big news out of Giants camp with Saquon Barkley returning. And then the biggest story of the week revolving around the Cincinnati Bengals. We're also going to have a segment on the Crawford-Spence fight. That's going to be Saturday in Vegas. This is a fight you thought that might happen five years ago. Then it was supposed to happen three years ago. They teased it last year. Here it finally is between two undefeated champions who've got 60-plus wins combined and another 50-plus knockouts combined that are going to fight for this welterweight crown on Saturday. And our our, one of our buddies from the show, Vinny's going to call in and he's going to break things down uh, as a big boxing enthusiast. That'll come at about 7.40 or so. But I really want to start with with the the pressing um, theme of sports right now Um, depending on where you sit in your fandom. And that, in my perspective, is Major League Baseball. All right, you've got the hot and the not, right? The Astros playing good ball again was inevitable. The pitching's coming together, offense waking up, Alvarez getting healthy at the right time. The Angels are playing good ball. And please tell me, in your lifetime, I'm sitting here tonight, 37 years old, if you've ever seen a baseball player be able to do the things Shohei Otani does. And I think it's because of that. And we know he's going to be a free agent next year. But I think the intelligent thing down in Anaheim that they were able to do was take him off the trade market. We used to have the same conversation a couple of years ago before injuries really started popping up. And that's not to say that he's not productive. Mike Trout, is who I'm referencing, is still one of the top 5'10 ball players in the world when he's healthy. We would have those conversations about, show me someone who does the things Trout does. Now we're having a conversation about another generational guy 
who's on his team. You've got two generational talents on the same team, and they've done squat with it to this point, and they're starting to heat up. And the Chicago Cubs are staying in this thing as well. And look who's creeping up the ladder in this hot category, the Miami Marlins, half a game out of the NL wildcard race. And if you saw what happened with Miami, who they acquired yesterday, they look to be serious buyers. More on that in a minute. The Raves and Braves. Was I higher on anyone going into the All-Star break than those two? Duh. They were the best two teams in baseball, specifically Atlanta. Tampa, 2-8 and eight across its last 10. One and a half games back of Baltimore for the AL East lead. Baltimore's got a three-game set at home coming up with the Yankees. And Aaron Judge is returning. So there's a lot going on between teams getting hot at a good time, teams falling by the wayside, and then these trade rumors that heat up. And I'll get into what the what the Marlins did uh, with the acquisition of David Robertson last night in a minute. But you continue to see the same rumors over and over as the 6 p.m. deadline on August 1 creeps closer. Cody Bellinger's name floated to the Yankees. The Mets have already started kind of unraveling their team. Don't forget, folks, season started. This was the most expensive team in the history of sports with contracts from the likes of Edwin Diaz, whose injury for the season anointed David Robertson the closer. Francisco Lindor's contract, plus you have Scherzer and Verlander on the books. Those are big deals. And the team hasn't been able to do much with it. So in addition to names like Cody Bellinger and Randall Grichuk being floated to the Yankees, who desperately need outfield depth and help, even with Judge coming back, you could see guys from Metsville, Marcana, Tommy Pham, connected to the Bombers. Now the Angels, for the time being, are going to stay put with Otani. I think that's good. They're back in this race. We're five plus out of the wild card race going into the All Star break, and here they are, right again, knocking on the door. And they're going to get healthy and reinforcements, a la Mike Trout, when he's fully healthy. Philly went through the same thing when Bryce Harper came back. You get him going, he's a difference maker. A Mets Yankees deal before the deadline would certainly be interesting. But I'll tell you a team you got to keep your eye on here. And it's it's not me saying anything profound that the American League East is the best division in baseball, because it is. Matter of fact, I thought there was a good chance, and I said it could happen, that each of the five teams would hit their overs if you do the over-under type stuff. The team to watch at this deadline, in my opinion, is the Boston Red Sox. Because they're continuing to play solid baseball, obviously, at a really good time. But check this out. Chris Sale, expected to begin his rehab assignment next week, so long as all of his live BP sessions that he'll partake in the rest of the week go smoothly. Now, he's been out since early June with a stress reaction in his left scapula. So that's a big deal. You get a big lefty, if he's right, who can kick it in that forward direction. You got two other starters coming back, Tanner Houck and Garrett Whitlock. They could be back off the 15-day injured list. They're throwing BP sessions as well. Now, the, the, the caveat here is if Alex Cora elects to put them in the rotation or use them out of the bullpen. Assets either way. So that's three arms Boston is going to get back as they remain very much in the thick of this race. Offensively? Trevor Story hasn't played since September 11th of 2022. Now, if rehab down at AAA Worcester continues to go well, Trevor Story could be back by tomorrow. For those listening live, that's July 29th. So he could be back by the weekend. This is huge. They make some noise in the market by bringing guys in, relief help, maybe another arm, a depth bat. This is a team that you take seriously. And that's the team I'm going to have my eyes on um, as we get into August 1st and then creep closer to that 6 o'clock on the East Coast PM hour when the trade deadline effectively ends. Team out of the National League I'm going to have my eyes on, 
who are right there, basically tied for that last spot in the National League, the Miami Marlins. They just go out and acquire David Robertson from the Mets. Now, from a Met perspective, you had to figure 17 and a half games back in the National League East, seven and a half games back of the Reds for the final wild card spot, that there was going to be something blatantly obvious that took place. Either Steve Cohen wasn't going to be able to be convinced that this team was out of it and that the National League East was over, plus they're six games under at 48 and 54, or that they, they were still in reach of the final wild card spot, let's become buyers. Well, you move on from your closer, who took the role at the beginning of the season, as I said earlier, when Diaz went down with a season-ending injury. So now Robertson's out of the fold. He goes to the Marlins. The Mets get in return two minor leaguers. So needless to say, this is a team that's going to look immensely different post-August 1st. And as I said a few minutes ago, this is a club that could still potentially move on from Tommy Pham and Mark Hanna. Now, Verlander and Scherzer, they're one in the two, are high-priced guys. Is it possible that they move them? You've seen Verlander connected to the Giants. You've seen him connected to the Rangers. I've seen uh, reports that had Scherzer potentially flirting with the Phillies. Don't see in any universe how that would be possible. But I did read it. I don't believe everything I read. Neither should you. I'm just putting it down there for the listeners as something that I saw. It's unlikely they move on from them, given the green that is attached to them. But it can't be ruled out. Omar Naveas could is another guy that you got to watch on this Mets team. This is a deconstruction, folks. And it started with the Robertson move. If a team that's contending needs catching help, Narvaez could be a nice option. He's only played in 21 games for the Mets this year. Outside of that, to play meaningful baseball, the Mets are 6-4 and four in their last 10. They get a 2-1 victory uh, in their first game of the series with the Nats last night in Queens. If you even thought, and Steve Cohen's a never-say-die guy, but you have to be realistic, hence why some of these moves are taking place, right? To stay in any sort of race at six games sub 500, even as this expected breakdown of the roster continues to happen, we think, you would, you, you all know. With four at home against the Nationals, now three after taking the first one Thursday night, followed by three again in Kansas City, the worst team in baseball that you've got to do damage. You've got to come out of that six and one. Mets go to Baltimore after that before they bring back uh, the Cubs, Braves, and Pirates to Queens for a nine-game homestand. So you look at that schedule and you say, hey, there's opportunity to pick up Ws. But then when you kind of revisit that homestand, Pirates aren't a bad team. They've stayed relevant for the most part. Cubs have remained relevant. Interesting what the Cubs may do here, specifically with Bellinger, who's having an unbelievable July at the dish. And Atlanta, who's a World Series favorite, or among them. Though they've kind of been teetering lately, uh, as I said at the top of the broadcast, same as the Rays in the AL East. Uh, Tampa Bay's actually dropped back to second place behind Baltimore. So there were opportunities there. You thought for the Mets to maybe win games. The conversation had to be in Queens. This is very unlikely. Let's see what we can do from a cap perspective and from a future perspective and move, guys. The first chip to fall, Robertson. And that was your closer. There's going to be other moves here with this team. What they are, I don't know. I'm speculating. Based on logistics and fam and canna are going to be useful pieces to teams like the Yankees who need that outfield depth. The Mets have pieces that are valuable to those fringe teams or those present contenders. Right now, the Yankees are a fringe team. Playoffs start today. Yankees are out. So they're looking to buy. And this continued deconstruction of the Mets that we expect to keep happening could very much reverberate across the way into the Bronx. It's happened before. It's rare. But if it were to happen, 
this is the type of year that it could because there are serious needs for this Yankee team in the outfield. And the might the Mets might have some options. You might not love Tommy Pham, but he gives you a quick stick at the plate and he runs the base as well. He can swipe bags. And he plays a nice outfield. Count as a fan favorite in Queens. He hasn't had the season this year that he did a year ago. But that kind of sums up how the Mets have been this year. After a 100-plus win campaign a year ago. Perhaps ahead of schedule. But the future is still positive here for the Mets, even if they break this down. You know, is it out of the question that they dangle a Mark Vientos out there? I don't think so. A Beatty? Doubtful. I think the franchise is in love with him, and I think you've seen a good amount that the kid can turn out to be a pretty damn good mlb And it looks like they've hit a home run with Alvarez behind the plate. Despite the nonsense they talk about his defense, this kid's the real deal. And he's got pop that's going to play well in Queens. So this isn't the season, obviously, Met fans wanted or thought they'd have. But this is not a long-term disaster, particularly when you have an owner like Steve Cohen who wants to win. And again, I'll, I've said this over and over. The only thing Steve Cohen cares about, what pe- how people view him or who view, views him, are Met fans and the club. And that's great. Everybody else can go scratch. That's how you build a winner. He'll get it done. Might not be this year. And this team's not going to quit either. But this is logical what has happened. And it started with trading your your, your closing pitcher to a division rival and, a, and, and, and an absolute contender in the Miami Marlins this year. But there is still a very, very bright and extremely serviceable roster for the New York Mets moving forward. Just because it's not this year doesn't mean that there are not pieces in place and financial flexibility, specifically by unloading some of these big contracts come August 1st. Those good things are still coming. Trust me. High fly ball, right center. Going back, more go. Track, wall, see ya. A home run for Judge. A two-run shot. Drill deep to left field. There it goes. Yeah, you've been missing that for 40 games. 49 games Aaron Judge has been in this season. 49 games he's played this year. Yankees 54 and 48, eight behind Baltimore, two and a half behind uh, Toronto for the final wild card spot. Aaron Judge comes back tonight for the first of three in Baltimore. 291 on the season, 19 homers, 40 driven in, 35 walks. Again, in the 49 games he's played. And that's music to Yankee fans' ears. That's basically like getting a free agent back. (laughs) And the irony was that the Yankees brought him back via free agency to the tune of a $300-plus million deal over the course of nine years. He gets banged up a couple of weeks ago, and he's out. And the Yankees' offense went on vacation with him. And it's the same things with this Yankee team that continue to frustrate you. Now, they will be major players, you would think, at the break. Last year, it was fishing for Luis Castillo, wound up with Frankie Montas, who we haven't seen this year because he was banged up. And you continue to have the conversation of, was he injured when he came on board last season at the deadline? And I bring that up because, again, this is a Yankee team that did did not start the second half of the season well, dropping two of three in Colorado, pathetic loss in one of them in extra innings. Then they get swept by a, at the time, a decent at best Anaheim team, one that has gone on an unbelievable run since then, before sweeping the terrible Royals and splitting two with the Mets. So it hasn't been an overly energetic, enjoyable, hey, the Yankees finally figured this out, second half thus far. I mentioned they're two and a half back of Toronto for the final wild card spot and presently last place in the stacked AL East. Yeah, every team in the American League East is a legitimate postseason contender. 
and as sloppy at times defensively, offensively for the most part, the last month plus that the Yankees have been, they're still in the race. Now you got three coming up in Baltimore starting tonight. It's put up or shut up time. Because after that, you come back home. You got three with Tampa Bay and four with Houston. And the way this offense has been going, you don't have an overwhelming amount of confidence, even with Aaron Judge back in the lineup, who's going to DH tonight in his return. And I think, again, as I bring up that annoyance with the Montas acquisition last season, not that they brought him on board because they filled the need. The fact that he wasn't great and it was attributed, potentially, which no one seems to want to bring up, the fact that the guy was hurt when he came here. And I, and I think, perhaps, my frustration has been, for the most part, incorrectly placed. Allow me to indulge. There's not a person who follows professional baseball on the major league level that wouldn't, to a degree, understand the offensive dip the Yankees would go through or any team when you lose an Aaron Judge caliber player. But when you have guys in the lineup like Harrison Bader, who's hit well lately, Anthony Rizzo, who potentially might be coming out of it. DJ LeMay, who is starting to come out of it. It's good to see him maybe rejuvenating himself and maybe his lower body's getting healthy. And Glaber Torres, who's actually been pretty solid offensively. Defense needs work. Where you would have guys that could keep you head above water. It just didn't happen. And here's where it gets absurd to me. I've been very open, and I know that I have been someone who's been hard on Aaron Boone. And for the most part, specifically as it relates to in-game decision-making at times, rightfully so. I think a lot of the things I said are justified. Overwhelming yourself with pitch counts, pitch limits, how many times through the order. Situational baseball, yes. It's in the baseball Bible. But so is managing with instinct and having a feel for the game. Not just doing things because a number or a scenario or a metric tells you. But here's where I think I might have to take a step back. Because just like with any company, business, and all organizations in sports, every team has an architect. And at 54 and 48, if the playoffs started today out of the postseason, Nothing the last couple of years that really knocked your socks off outside of bringing Judge back, which needed to be done, and getting Carlos Rodon, who finally, against the Mets the other night, looked like the pitcher the Yankees thought they were getting. I think this is where we shift our annoyance. The architect of this team is Brian Cashman. And you'll remember, for those Yankee fans and baseball fans who are enthusiasts, once the hot start from last season dipped, The Yankees struggled to produce runs. They could not hit. And that was never on a brighter stage than when they got swept in the ALCS by the Astros. Folks, are the same things not continuing? Are the same thing? Well, why would you go back and talk about last year's ALCS? Because nothing has changed. There's six games above 500, and it's mostly due to their pitching. And the bullpen has been wonky uh, going back a couple of weeks. It hadn't been that rock stop you know, brick wall that they've had. But they've gotten out of that as well. So out, and I'll ask you this about Cashman, being the architect here. Outside of re-signing Judge, team captain, productivity on the field, overall defense, and Rodon. What has Brian Cashman legitimately done as the architect of this team to make them better? The refusal to bring up talented crop of ball players is absurd outside of the Volpe kid who thank God they stuck with because I, I'm a true believer in this young man. I, he's got the goods. Case in point, Estevan Florial, who all you ever hear about this 25 year old is that the Yankees are dangling him out as a play as a trade ship. He's having an unbelievable season at AAA, 291, 388 on base percent, 585 slugging, 21, 22 home runs, 53 runs uh, driven in, and 18 bags. Yet you got guys like Franchi Cordero, who stinks, still holding a roster spot on the 40-man. 
And you know what that is? That's the GM looking at Florial's past success or lack thereof in the bigs, which was minimal, because they feel he strikes out too much. This is a joke, plain and simple. You've got that 25-year-old who's one of your better prospects basically rotting down there, but still performing on the AAA level, major league numbers, and he's not going to get a crack on a team that can't hit anything right now. Like they're swinging toothpicks up there because they think he strikes out too much. Yet Franchi Cordero, who was a week and a half flash in the pan, has a spot on the 40 man. Oswald Peraza, I know he was banged up early in the season. Should have been with the big club it, from the from the word go, and he should be here moving forward because he's a strong fielder and a hitter. Did you look at this Yankee team moving forward? Oh, two and a half back of the last wild card spot. That's your goal? That's fine if your goal is the Cincinnati Reds, who had one of the worst seasons in franchise history a year ago after a 3-22 and start. If they get in as a wild card, yeah, that could be your goal. You're the freaking New York Yankees. I'm not saying you got to go out and win a World Series every year, but to just stand pat. Now you've got rumors about being linked to Cody Bellinger from the Cubs. When you could have just had him for cash in the offseason, now you're probably going to have to give up some pretty legit, legitimate young talent to go get him if that's the route you choose to go. Barring a complete 180, from where Steinbrenner lives, and as I've said in the past, which is an alternate freaking reality, nothing's going to happen. Because you've got managers, GMs, they're not going to hold these guys accountable, like a Joe Torrey, or even like a Buck used to do. The case in point here is that it's time for a new architect. Because the house that Ruth built is presently made of bones that are on the verge of completely crumbling. And as a 37-year Yankee fan, someone will listen to this show who has nothing invested in the Yankees and say all this guy's doing is he, he, from his ivory Yankee tower is bitching and moaning. Yeah, because there would be a lot of teams in the league right now, including probably the Mets, who would love to be in the position the Yankees are. But right now, if you want to be realistic, where the Yankees are is out of the playoffs and in last place in the American League East and all of the teams they are chasing are flat out better than they are as we sit here tonight and that is coming from a lifelong Yankee fan and if nothing changes we're do- we're going in circles because it's not like this team doesn't have money to spend It's not like they don't have the wherewithal to realize the things that they need. You've got aging talent, the likes of Rizzo, LeMahieu, Donaldson, who's on the 60-day DL. I know that. You've got injuries, Loisega in the bullpen on the 60-day. Hurts them more than you probably realized it would. If they're going to be legitimately in this race, Judge has to stay on the field. They've got to get more from Stanton. They need LeMahieu and Torres to continue to do what they've done the last, well, for Torres since the All-Star break, LeMahieu, the last two weeks, and it comes down to that rotation. Rodon's got to be the guy they thought he was when they got him in the offseason, and Garrett Cole, the All-Star starter, who goes tonight in Game 1 in Baltimore against Grayson Rodriguez, 9-2, and 2-7-8 ERA, he's got to continue to be the alpha dog. And then you're going to have to start shaking things up between Boone, Cashman, and the delusional Hal. Because we've been having this conversation for a month, and I think it's fair that you start putting the onus where it belongs. And that is solely for this mediocre at best Yankee team on Brian Cashman. It's It's unfathomable to me that this team was in the ALCS a year ago and the same things that hindered them then are doing this are, are hindering them now and nothing has changed. And barring a complete overhaul on the buyer side, this is what they're going to be for the rest of the season. 
That may be good enough to make the playoffs, but they ain't going far. Not better than Houston, Texas, the other four teams in the division ahead of them. Maybe you can pick one of them off. But outside of that, no. As far as the overall standings concerned, where the Yankees need to go, jumping teams becomes a lot more doable when you get, now you have Judge coming back. The return of Bowers. If they can get him right, he's got that big swing that plays well in the Bronx. Nestor Cortez returning after being placed on the 60-day DL. That return could come in next week or in two weeks, early August. That's huge. Loisega, who I just mentioned, is out until next month, probably late, even early September. He's got that right elbow bone spur. You might see Montas in the second half. I doubt it. The throwing program he began in late May. Um, Aaron Boone, doctors all say everything looks good, but there's really no timetable there. So if you can get some of those guys back, it's doable. But the way the offense has been for the most part lately, man, it's a damn good time to have number 99 back in the lineup. But the leadership group on this team has got to really take their heads out of their butts. Otherwise, we're going to be stuck in the mud like this team has been for quite some time. It, Folks, it really, to me, is that simple. And I know, complaining as a Yankee fan, most people don't want to hear it. But it's become a little bit ridiculous that everything is hunky-dory to the powers that be, and it's the people paying to go to the games, watching the games, and even playing these games mind you, who see these problems and these deficiencies, yet nothing gets done. And we'll continue to have these conversations for as long as we need to because it's relevant. And from my universe, it's accurate. Okay, Daryl Spence backing up. Lamont Peterson. Oh, Look, you don't have to be the biggest boxing fan on planet Earth or even know all that much about the sport itself. If you're a sports fan, the event you'll see Saturday night, the 29th in Vegas, is something you're going to want to sit down and watch. Terrence Crawford, Errol Spence Jr., fighting for the undisputed welterweight crown, Crawford. The 36-year-old, Spence, the quintessential power puncher. He's bigger. He's stronger. 33 years old. Both fighters undefeated. Knockout specialists. Southpaws. I mean, this is a fight that's been built up for, folks, half a decade. And it's going to have an old-school feel to it. Because these guys have been around. And they fought the best and beaten the best. And now they're finally going to step between the ropes Saturday night in Vegas for what could potentially be one of the better legitimate true boxing bouts we've seen in quite some time. It might not have that name flair to it that you might get with a Floyd or a Canelo or a Manny. But this is true boxing, which is why everyone that you see, if it's an Atlas, if it's a Freddie Roach, who's been doing a lot of talking about this bout. When they're that excited to break this down pound for pound, expected punch for expected punch, you know it's a big deal. And with that, I'll bring in our buddy Vinny. Uh, Vin, what's up, man? Hi, Pete. How are you? Good, man. What's going on? I know uh, Vinny and I were talking a little bit yesterday. Uh, just as a prereq to the show, because um, Vinny knows a hell of a lot more about boxing than I do. But Vin, and, and kind of as I as I teased everything that we're about to uh, kind of break down and discuss, before we get into the nitty gritty, why would an, a, a regular boxing fan or just an average sports fan find this bout tomorrow night uh, of intrigue? Well, it's what's going on in boxing. The best haven't been fighting the best for years. 
This is totally agree. This is equivalent in my book to when Jerry Leonard fought Tommy Hearns. Both two undefeated fighters, great fighters. Hearns a knockout artist. Sugar Ray was just coming off beating Duran in the Nomas fight. This is this is it. These two guys could have fought in any era. That's how good they are. I mean, they are they are phenomenal fighters. This fight could have taken place two, three years ago. Errol Spence has been going through some stuff the last three years. He had a very bad car accident three years ago where he shouldn't have lived. And he came back and he beat two really good fighters pretty easily in Danny Garcia and the Jordanus Ugas, who was one of the best Cuban fighters ever. And, it's, and, he, and this guy Ugas had beaten Crawford twice in the amateurs. So there's a lot of talk going around about this fight. There's a lot of stuff that's under the hat. I know from a few people that Spence and Crawford had sparred years ago, and Spence had got the better of him in sparring. They're keeping that under the hat right now because they want to sell the fight. Sure. But I'm going to break. I'm going to this. This is this is Sugar Ray Leonard, Tommy Hearns. That, this is what it is. Now I'm going to break down the fight for you. They got Crawford has been fighting guys that Spence beat in their prime, and Crawford got him later. After their prime, he fought Sean Porter after Spence fought him. He fought Kell Brook after Spence fought him. So Crawford's resume is a little tainted, but he, he's a great fighter. He could fight right handed, then he goes southpaw. He's deadly when he fights southpaw. That's what usually happens in his fights. He starts out right handed, he gets hit early as a right handed fighter, then he switches lefty, and then he just he takes over. But now with Spence, Spence is a southpaw, so that trick is just not going to work in this, in this fight. So as I see this fight, Spence is a naturally bigger guy. He walks around at 175. He could fight at 154 or 160 easily. Crawford's coming up from 135. He's been rocked a few times. He was rocked against Gamboa. He was rocked two years ago in a, in a, in a 140-pound fight. So his ch chin is a little... It's a little iffy. Now, now, Spence, on the other hand, this kid's got a granite chin. He was hitting his last fight against Jordanus Ugas. Spence has a bridge in his mouth. He thought his teeth fell out, so he spit out his mouthpiece. And Ugas hit him when he wasn't looking with a right hand. That would have took down a tree. <laughs> and this kid didn't even flinch. When I tell you, he didn't even flinch. So you got the majority of the boxing experts, Teddy Atlas, all these guys, they're all picking Crawford to win. Because he's winning flashier, but well, gonna... Freddie Roach recently said that he he thinks he's that Crawford's the best fighter in the game. You don't agree? No, I don't. Spencer's Spencer's. I'm gonna I'm gonna break it down. I'm gonna tell you how the fight's gonna go. The fight's gonna go like this. This this is gonna be a great fight. The five six rounds gonna be very competitive, and then Spencer's just gonna do what he does. He breaks you down. He takes your will away. He takes your life away from you. This guy is a killer. You cannot hurt him. He is like Marvin Hagler reincarnated. He, you, just, you just cannot take this guy. He's going to take Crawford's soul away. I'm looking for a ninth, tenth round stoppage. And I, I'm, if guys want to win some money tomorrow night, you bet on Errol Spence. That's all I'm going to tell you. Bet on Errol Spence. Everybody's in the Crawford camp. I would say 75 to 80% of the people are in the Crawford camp because of what he's been doing to guys. Sure. He's been beating up guys, but the guys he's been beating, they are like got one foot out the door and one foot in retirement, like Sean Porter and Kel Brook. These guys were there for a paycheck. Spence beat these guys when they were on top of their game. You know? And, but just, I'm telling you, that's how it's going to go. Four, five, six rounds, you're going to see great action. It's going to be back and forth, but Spence is going to take the heart right out of Crawford. So he is going to pull... Yeah. From a betting perspective, uh, the one, the minus one forty on Crawford is that fair? It's, uh, it's that's what it's I all, saw it last, which I think was this morning. You know, you know, you know what I call it? It's all the stupid money. It's okay. people that don't know. It's people that don't know boxing that see what Crawford's been doing to washed up names. It's just they don't realize what Spence does. They don't know the game. Spence is a killer. Spence, you cannot hurt this man. This man is indestructible. 
You'll see it tomorrow night. When he, he, this kid loves to mix it up, and he throws thudding shots. I mean, and he, the whole thing is he's technically great, too. He can stay on the outside. He can mix it up with you. He's got a great jab. He works behind his jab. This kid is just, he's phenomenal. You, you're you're going to see it tomorrow night. He's going to rock Crawford late. But it'll be a good, entertaining fight for six, seven, eight rounds. It'll be back and forth. But then Crawford just going to Crawford just going to beat the life out of him at the end of the fight. That's what's well, going to happen. I'm, let me just yeah. ask you this too, from the perspective of uh, ability and and craftsmanship here. Uh, when we spoke last night, you even had said how much of a traditional power puncher Spence can be because when he yeah. hits you, you feel it and you can see he's, it. Crawford he's a third pu- kind of his athleticism. He's got a wrestling background. So from a finesse perspective, Vin, Spence seems like he's getting more of the nod from the power perspective. But then you look at someone like Terrence Crawford, who's got three years on him in age. He's got 30 knockouts to his credit. So what's the power uh, perspective for Crawford? We know what Spence brings to the table in that regard. How about Crawford? Why are people so high on him? Where does his power come from against his finesse? Crawford does really well. If he fights in between what I'm, what I'm trying to say is when a guy's punching, he's got great instincts. He knows how to hit somebody before they're throwing their shot. And when he knocks you out, he usually catches you off guard, which is the punch that guys don't see that guys get knocked out from, like Manny Pacquiao got knocked out from, from uh, Marquez, and Ricky Hatton got knocked out from Pac- It's the punch you don't see that Crawford lands so well. That's what he does good. He's a, he, he's a very powerful guy. He, he's got very long arms for this weight class. He's got a two-inch reach advantage on Spence. Very long arms for this weight class. But he catches you in between. Do you understand what I'm saying when he catches you in between? Yes. Like, he catches you when you're not looking. And he just, he, he's got great instincts and he's got a great feel for the game. That works against B and C fighters, but that ain't going to work against Ella Spence because he is so technically sound. He's got one of the greatest trainers in the game, too. i got to mention Derek James. The guy mm-hmm. has got a stable of fighters right now. He's got Charlo. He's got Anthony Joshua. He just, he just got Ryan Garcia back in, his, in the stable now. He's got both, uh, both Charlo brothers who's fighting Canelo in September. That's a big fight coming up also. But it's just Crawford don't got enough for this type of fight. And to me, he's going to be 36 years old in September. Yeah. He could have had – Crawford could have signed this fight for the last four years, and he was with top rank. He was with Bob Arum. Bob Arum wanted nothing to do with this fight because he was making $10 million a fight with Crawford. So he – Crawford was his cash cow for five years, and they never wanted to sign this fight because they knew if he lost to Spence, the money would be gone. Yeah. I mean, he was – he could have fought Pacquiao, Crawford, but – because they were both in the same stable with top rank, and he wanted nothing to do with fighting Pacquiao. So Crawford's been building his resume on guys that have, were names at one time but were on the end of their career. Crawford hasn't built his – Crawford has not fought one top guy at the top of his game, where Spence has fought several. So, And, I, and I'll say it just from, from a, I guess, a somewhat of a recency perspective. You keep bringing up – you mentioned Manny's name a couple of times. When Marquez knocked out Pacquiao, I was as stunned as anybody. Um, I, I, oh, yeah. I don't get the sense that anybody would be totally shocked either way here. You've said from jump that you are a Spence guy, but are you are you going to bed tomorrow night shocked if Crawford comes away with a win here? I would be. I would be shocked. That I would be. You so, would be. Okay. I'd be completely shocked. Just watching. I've been following El Spence. Since his third, fourth fight, this kid is a dog. He does not like to lose. I mean, you remember Marvin Hagler? Sure. Remember the you remember the Hagler Hearns fight? You remember that three? Do you nineteen eighty five? It was a three round. It was a war. Hagler wasn't losing that fight. They had to carry him out of there. Killed. He was. Hearns hit him. Hearns had the biggest right, one of the biggest right hands in boxing history. Hearns hit him with shots that would have took down an elephant. This guy walked through it. This is the kind of guy Errol Spence is. He will walk through, he will walk through a double barrel shotgun. That's, that's what people don't understand about this kid. He will walk through fire, and he just does not like, he don't give an inch, this kid. You'll see it tomorrow night. You'll def, you'll, you, 
you will see it tomorrow night. I, 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 I've been following boxing a long time, and this kid, this kid is a throwback. He is a throwback to those days with the guy with the Rand Hagel, Leonard Hearns. He's a throwback to these guys. Crawford's yeah. a really good fighter, but he's just not on his level. And I think, again, like you said in the beginning, uh, the reason to watch is because of just the, the it's storylines galore here. Two undefeated fighters, welterweight yeah. crown, undisputed on the line. And the resumes that both have built are yeah. page after page after page. Um, Absolutely. And, and, I, and I, I really think it's, it's going to be a treat because like you've said and like so many of others said, really, Vinny, the only thing you're saying different from some of the others is that you like Spence. Because I think it's 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 three out of every four is picking Crawford to this point. But what you've all poetically said is that this bout could be so big for the sport of boxing because it really yes. could bring back the essence of what the game was uh, during the age of yesteryear. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's putting what, boxing on the front four again between two well, fighters what, who deserve to be there. Yeah, it's what, it's what the promoters destroyed. They just. I mean, what yeah. Canelo Alvarez singly destroyed boxing because this guy, he fights guys, he loses, and he gets decisions. People get disgusted. You know, I got this four fights that Canelo Alvarez had. He lost both Triple G fights. Yes. He lost, he lost, both, he lost a, uh, another Cuban, Lara, Edison Lara. He lost that fight. Canelo should have six losses. His last fight against Dimitri Bivol, he got beat so bad. He lost 11 out of 12 rounds, and the judges had it only one. The judges had Bivol having to win the 12th round to win the fight. People get sick of the corruption. This is what Teddy Atlas goes on and on about, about his, on his podcast. The corruption is just it, – it, the judges are so bought and paid for, it's, it's scary. And I just hope it's not in their hands tomorrow night because they know how to – they ruin boxing. I just hope it's not in their hands tomorrow night. That's all I could say. I, I, I'm in complete agreement with you, and I hope so. Um, so, th th I mean, there you have it. Tomorrow night, Saturday, uh, July 29th. Folks, tune into this fight because you're not yeah. going to be disappointed. For seven or eight rounds, this is going to be a bond burner. This is going to be a bond burner. I'm telling yeah. you, these guys are going to – and the undercard is great as well. There's a great undercard on, too. The whole card is – the whole card is – this is a throwback card. Okay? Well, Vin, hey, Vin listen, I, awesome breakdown because it's not something – generally uh, you know that i really had i think maybe once or twice uh, on my yeah. previous platform the call we had some uh boxing enthusiasts calling but that was great breakdown uh, really looking forward to it but just real quick because i know you are chomping at the bit because i'm going to transition after the next break um just give me what you think about dalvin cook probably joining the jets and then with the jets preseason kicking off next week uh out in canton uh how you think all of this Aaron Rodgers stuff is going to continue because it's, it's coming and it's coming quick. The jets. There's I don't know who's running this team. You got four running backs right now. You got Brees Hall probably coming back in November. You just drafted a rookie. You got Michael Carter. You got Donovan Knight. Yeah. Running backs right now. What are they? A diamond dozen? Am I right or wrong? They're a diamond dozen right now. You got Aaron Rodgers, and you want to sign another running back. Meanwhile, Makai Beckham is, Probably done. Your right, starting right tackle, your starting left tackle, Dwayne Brown, is 37 years old on the pup list. Who is going to block for these people? Their offensive line is a disaster. Who is going to block for Aaron Rodgers? There's one football, and now you're signing another running back? Then you get Aaron Rodgers to throw the ball? Honestly. How many running backs do you need? That would take 29. They, didn't they go through this with Robinson last year? They signed him, and then, he, then, they, then they inactivated him. They released him. They lost a fifth-round pick for James Robinson last year. He, yeah, this, now he's this, a giant. <laughs> until this organization gets a real head coach, and I will say it again, this guy Salah is a buffoon. He is a used car salesman. He does not know what he's doing. The AFC is loaded. Okay, you got the upper yeah. you got the upper echelon teams. What do you got? The Chiefs, the Bills, the the Bengals, you got Baltimore, you got Miami, then you got the other teams. You got Tennessee, you got Pittsburgh, you got the Chargers, you got the Browns that are gonna be really good. You watch the year Elijah Moore has now. You watch yeah, I know. they love they love him in Cleveland, Elijah Moore. They love him in Cleveland. And then we Don't got the thing on with the Jaguars. 
and the Jaguars. I forgot about the Jaguars. Now, you had the thing yesterday, Sean Payton. Sean Payton, what's the matter? You can't tell the truth no more? He came out and told the truth. What, what a mess that Denver was last year with the Jets' new offensive coordinator, Nathaniel Hackett. He yep. said this team was a disaster. Now, well, I know what he's doing. He's trying to build his quarterback up, Russell Wilson. Of course. You know, he, he's trying to build his quarterback back up. But the Jets, if the Jets win seven games, it'll be a miracle. It'll be a miracle. They will be three and eight by Thanksgiving. You can laugh. I hear you laughing. Oh, I'm not just a kid. I love it. <laughs> if they win seven games, it's going to be a miracle. They only got Aaron Rodgers because the Giants made the playoffs and won a game. He was so embarrassed that Brian Dable came in his first year with a lame duck quarterback, Daniel Jones, and turned this guy around and made the Giants into play. A play. They won a playoff game. That's why Woody Johnson went out and got Aaron Rodgers. I don't care what anybody says. He is yeah. so jealous of what the Giants did last year. And he's an idiot because he could have had Doug Peterson or Sean Payton. In a heartbeat, yeah. Sean Payton didn't want to go to Denver. He would have came to New York in a heartbeat. What do you think he's? What do you think he's flapping about the Jets for? He wanted to be a Jet coach, you know. Jet fans are in brother. for Jet fans listen, are in for a rule. Yeah, we're gonna yeah. we're gonna we're gonna learn a lot uh, in the coming weeks. Preseason week one gets gets uh, gets off next week. Jets Browns and Canton the Hall of Fame game, uh, and then yeah. and then we go from there. But. Uh, Vinny, listen, I appreciate it, man, specifically the boxing Thanks, stuff. Uh, yeah, Thank man, I, we, we love you, and uh, I'll talk to you uh, hopefully next week. All right, brother? I'll see you, Mon- I'll see you Monday at the Staten Island Amateur. Yeah, you will see me there Monday. Vinny and I are playing in the same uh, golf qualifier, as a matter of fact. So that'll be All fun. Right. Well, have, Thanks, well, brother. I'll see Monday. you then. Have a good day. Bye. All right, dude. So, yeah, I mean, listen, that was that as, as, as clean of a breakdown as you're going to get for a significant about as you're going to see in recent time between Crawford and Spence. Uh, out in Vegas tomorrow night. The fight will probably go off around 11 uh, p.m. on the East Coast after all the undercards. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm with Vinny. A- a- as much as Crawford is going to be the favorite there, and it's a minuscule favorite uh, on the Vegas lineup at minus 140, uh, you probably got every two and a half to three people out of four uh, going with Crawford. That hook and that power and the generation of power that Spence brings at 28-0, Crawford 39-0, Right, 52 knockouts combined, I think it was. Uh, I like Spence on that card as well uh, to walk away the undisputed welterweight uh, champion. I think it's going to be great stuff overall. Um, And, you know, I'm right there with Vin, lockstep with the way uh, he broke things down. Uh, It's going to be a fun one, and it's going to be really great for the sport of boxing at a time it needs it, perhaps most ever. And here's what the Giants need to see more of. Saquon Barkley cuts back. Look at the Jets. Explosive play from Barkley just when they needed it most. A little pitch. Barkley looking for a seed. Great cut. Saquon Barkley in for the touchdown. Barkley muscling forward. As a, as a lifelong Giant fan and a, and, a, and a living and breathing die on every move the franchise makes, I haven't had as much fun watching Giants football uh, as I did last year in quite some time for obvious reasons. Saquon Barkley was a big reason for that. Earlier in the week, agreeing to the one-year $11 million contract that includes the $2 million bonus. That's significant because as we went around the circles, Barkley was holding out. It was either sit out, miss the season, miss weeks, or you sign the franchise tag. That was basically what he got. $10.1 million is what he would have originally made by signing the tender. It was a reworked deal by Joe Shane, adding initial incentives that I think were north of uh, just over $900,000, which will now allow Barkley to earn up to $11 million. Now, he can't sign the long-term deal this season which leaves him with three options for next year, and they're fairly obvious. He'll either hit free agency, get the tag again, or receive a long-term deal. But when you saw that football team play last year, yes, the defense had its moments. This move made too much sense for both times, and believe me, I don't agree with paying top dollar for running backs. Kansas City Chiefs proved that time and time again, just won a Super Bowl without the alpha dog. And there's no other Christian McCaffrey in the league. 
that's deserves $16 million. Nobody deserves that money anyway to, to run around with a little brown ball. But be it as it may, he's in a league of his own. The move makes sense for the Giants because it now reunites Saquon with Daniel Jones, who got the long-term deal. And if that flops, the Giants can get out of the Jones deal in two years. So isn't it nice, folks, when you don't have morons running your organization and you can see the light at the end of the tunnel? Now, the Giants were ahead of schedule, but they got some damn good talent coming back here. You got a dual-threat cornerback now reunited with one of his top playmakers and his probably preeminent top playmaker in Saquon Barkley because last season the two put together a heck of a show. Now look around the Giants roster, specifically on offense. The addition of Darren Waller, who runs like a freaking gazelle when he's healthy. Paris Campbell comes over from the Colts. Still an underrated move that gives him a legitimate outside threat. Darius Slayton, a lot of Giant fans aren't high on him. I am. I think he's a legitimate deep threat. Isaiah Hodgins came off a breakout campaign a year ago. If you can get the speedster Wandale Robinson, the, the, the second-year player out of Kentucky, you've, you're working with something there offensively. Now you got a slot guy in Cole Beasley who will get reps. Brian Dable loves him. You've got one of the best left tackles in football in Andrew Thomas who just got re-upped. And you have the expectation that rookie center John Michael Schmitz is going to earn the number one role in that spot. Case in point, the re-upping of Barkley simply needed to happen. And the Giants did it wisely because they took finances and contract years into account. You had to lock up your quarterback. You don't have to love Daniel Jones, but the bottom line is the Giants do, and they locked up the guy that they think can bring them to where they want to go. And if you watch that playoff game against the Minnesota Vikings last year, they don't win that game without Barkley or specifically Daniel Jones. So do the math. All right. I mean, as good as Barkley is, he's got a damn good quarterback playing alongside him. Now, you bring back Barkley a year ago, fully healthy, 295 carries, over 1,300 yards, 10 touchdowns, 58 receptions on 76 targets for nearly another 350 yards. This is huge. This is a big deal for the Giants as they continue to build back up to being one of the more respected, legitimately contending franchises in the National Football League. It started with Jones working that offensive line. Andrew Thomas gets paid. Now you got Barkley. They'll have some guys on defense to pay in the years to come. They'll worry about that. But they've got legitimate, intelligent human beings running the show again. And you're starting to see that now with these intelligent deals that are keeping the faces of the franchise, a la Saquon and Jones, in the fold. That's huge. Starting to look like the Giants again, folks. And that's big. Talked a little bit about the Jets earlier with Vinny. Aaron Rodgers takes a huge pay cut. And that was significant because it's giving the Jets more financial flexibility. I don't like to use that term super team. We all know the comments at Sean Payton, backhanded comments about these things don't ever work when the teams try to win the offseason and the marketing campaigns like the Jets are doing with uh, hard knocks. But Aaron Rodgers initially signed at 39 years old, a two-year, $75 million contract, and every cent of that two-year deal is fully guaranteed. Earlier in this week, he reworked it, and it's going to reduce his salary by basically $35 million across the next two seasons. He's going to lose by reworking his contract. He's not even going to miss it. Isn't that nice? $35 million loss. He's going to take a $35 million bath. For the sake of the franchise. And would you know it? He doesn't have to go to school every day, get yelled at by kids, have things thrown at him. It's amazing. I'm kidding. You all know I love being a teacher, but I just had to say $75 million and he's going to net 40 from it to give the Jets flexibility, perhaps to bring in Dalvin Cook, who's going to meet with the Jets on Sunday. That would be the 31st. And he's highlighting, quote, the Jets has, quote, his preferred destination, and that's according to multiple sources. Uh, Cook has also stated this week that it's, quote, highly likely that he signs with the Jets. Now, Miami, the Patriots are among the other teams that have been interested with him. I think I saw the Chicago Bears, Detroit Lions potentially in there. Cook has some interest in the Dolphins, but uh, it, th- from a financial perspective now, there really would be no reason why the Jets wouldn't do this. And then outside of that, because we're going to have plenty of time um, to talk football, we don't we don't have to 
jump the gun um, as of yet. But the biggest news to come out of the NFL this week, outside of the Barkley contract, was news yesterday that Joe Burrow is going to miss, quote, several weeks after straining his calf Thursday. Now, several weeks, um, according to Coach Zach Taylor, means several weeks. So it looks like beginning of the season is in serious jeopardy for Joe Burrow, meaning Trevor Simeon and Jake Browning right now are the two quarterbacks currently on the Bengals' depth chart ahead of the preseason. They're going to get serious looks now, and you would have to think you go into the free agent pool here to try to keep head above water uh, because this Bengals team is a contender. They are Super Bowl quality, but not without Joe Cool. And this is going to be an issue and something to certainly uh, keep track of as we continue to move forward. And no one enjoys watching the likes of Burrow, Mahomes more than I do. So this sucks from a football perspective, and it's going to reverberate through the fantasy ranks as well, which we'll get into. I also do want to tease to the fact that I don't have an official start date yet, but I will be launching a Saturday morning football show uh, under the Sports Today with Peter J. Guys, the same platform. So you get my show regularly, however you listen, if you listen live on Podbean or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, iHeart, uh, tune in, whatever it might be, Google, Samsung, every Saturday from probably 10 to 11.30, right before the noon football games in college start. I'm going to do a college and NFL breakdown of the week that was and the week that is to come. Um, So we'll get into all the intricacies from a uh, game-to-game perspective and a fantasy betting perspective um, as well. As far as the preseason in the NFL is concerned, Thursday, August 3rd, Jets, Browns playing in the Hall of Fame game in Canton, Ohio. Our buddy Joe Jett is actually out there now. And it's Hall of Fame Enshrinement Week, August 3rd to the 6th. Darrell Revis and Joe Klecko, um, among those getting into the Hall of Fame. Klecko, been waiting around for this for a while, folks. Um, and there are no happier people outside of the Klecko family than Jet Nation to watch Joe Klecko get inducted into the Pro Football uh, Hall of Fame. It was a long time coming. And it's finally going to happen uh, next week. And obviously, you've been paying attention around the world of soccer. You got the Women's World Cup. Eight countries made their debut this time around, following the expansion uh, to 32 teams. And it's it's been interesting. Uh, you look around the various groups, Switzerland in Group A has played well. Nigeria and Canada right there in Group B. Spain, uh, England, the United States deadlocked the top Group E um, with four points um, and so on and so forth. Brazil and France, Sweden was among the favorites along with Italy and Germany. Colombia's played well to this point. Um, so there's still a lot going on. Uh, and with this expansion to 32 teams, folks were kind of weary that it would have a negative impact on the quality of soccer uh, being played. But if you're one of those eight countries, uh, Portugal, Portugal, Panama, Vietnam, Haiti, Morocco, Zambia, Ireland, uh, and the Philippines, no one's happier than you to finally have this on this stage. And the Philippines in their Women's World Cup debut go out the other night and get a win against the home host country in New Zealand. The tournament is being hosted between Austria and New Zealand. So the storylines here have been pretty good thus far. Uh, you'd, you'd probably sit there and think that it, the United States, New Zealand, Spain, and Sweden would be, and even Canada, would be amongst your favorites there. Uh, but anything can happen as this tournament continues. Speaking of tournaments, you've got the 3M Open taking place at TPC Twin Cities this week in Minnesota. Um, and this is coming on the heels of Brian Harmon's victory Uh, at the Open Championship in England a week ago, which was awesome. You heard some highlights uh, from that at the top of the broadcast. Lee Hodges uh, has got a one-shot lead over Kevin Kevin Streelman, JT Poston, and Tyler Duncan uh, as we head into the weekend. Um, It's an interesting tournament for many reasons. Good field, and you've got some guys trying to get the kinks out. Tony Finau, Hideki Matsuyama's playing some good golf. Billy Horschel. Uh, and Brant Snedeker are there. Zach Blair's playing well. Cooch is out um, on the course. They've had some weather delays out there in Blaine, Minnesota. Uh, so this is something to keep an eye on 
um, as you watch this uh, moving forward uh, this weekend uh, on the PGA Tour. Um, a sad note out of the world of college football. Uh, Notre Dame legend and 1947 Heisman Trophy winner Johnny Lujak uh, passed away earlier this week at the age of 98. Those of you who followed me on my various platforms know that uh, you won't meet a bigger Notre Dame fan than myself. Uh, and you simply cannot have a conversation about the University of Notre Dame as a school or a football program without including and mentioning Johnny Lujak. Uh, three-time national champion at Notre Dame, 1943, 46, and 47. Two-time All-American. Uh, won his, and this is interesting. He won his first title at ND. In 43, he was a sophomore. Took over the QB spot. When 1943 Heisman Trophy winner Angelo Bertelli left late in the season for an undefeated Notre Dame team to serve in World War II as a member of the U.S. Marine Corps. At the time, Notre Dame was 6-0. They'd go on um, to finish the job, and Lou Jack would go on the next two years to serve in the Navy before returning to Notre Dame in 1946. That same year, he was a first-round pick by the Bears. In that 1946 draft, now remember, uh, or maybe you learned something, the NFL draft back then was 32 rounds. The Irish had four guys picked in the first round of that draft, 16 players overall. Uh, and Lou Jack could uh, run it and throw it. Passing leader, touchdown leader, rushing leader across 1949 and 1950. And he was a two-time Pro Bowler for the team that drafted him, the Chicago Bears. Notre Dame and Johnny Lou Jack are synonymous and I have had many a conversation uh, about the impact that he had on my life growing up from a fan perspective, um, from learning about the guys with Johnny Lujak, the Bertellis of the world, uh, the Johnny Latners of the world. Later, you know, as I, as I started getting older, Tim Brown, the Rocket Ishmaels, uh, the Joe Montanas, the Theismans of the world, Tommy Clements, uh, Steve Berline. Oh, you know, all these good quarterbacks. Reggie Ho, the good kicker uh, from 1988. Obviously, Tony Rice, the last quarterback to lead Notre Dame to a national championship. Uh, but it, it was around the likes of Newt Rockney, Arab Parsegian, Frank Leahy, and guys like Johnny Lujak. Uh, so condolences out to the Lujak family and really uh, the Notre Dame family and Notre Dame community as a whole uh, because that is a big loss. Um, for really someone who was a larger-than-life figure in South Bend um, and the college football and national football landscape for many, many years. Johnny Lujak passing away earlier this week uh, at the age of 1998. Uh, we're going to wrap up the show. Obviously, want to thank Vinny, our buddy Vin, for calling in to break down uh, the Spence-Crawford fight, which is going to uh, launch uh, right around 11 o'clock tomorrow night in Vegas. It's going to be some good stuff. Um You've got something to look forward to this entire weekend, whether it's boxing, baseball, golf, the U.S. Women's World Cup. It's all there for you. I'll see you same time, same place next Friday, August 4th, right here live at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Vinny teased it on a personal note. For those around the New York City area, golf fans, you've, on Staten Island, you've got maybe the biggest tournament of the year, the Staten Island Amateur Qualifier up at the beautiful Richmond County Country Club. I think 46 guys are playing, only 16 get in. Our buddy Vinny and I are going to try to do that very thing Monday up at RCCC in the Staten Island Amateur Qualifier. Thanks, folks. We love you all. I'll talk to you next week, same time, same place, right here on Sports Today with Peter J. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Stay cool. I'll see you soon. Sports Today with Peter J.